wealthy country, if you haven't noticed. Compared to some countries in the world, the person who has very little in this country is much wealthier than half, probably even more than half of the world's population. I'll just bring some numbers. Approximately half of world's population, which is more than 3 billion people, make less than $2.50 a day, and more than 1.3 billion of people live in extreme poverty. They, ha they are just making, they have less than $1.3 a day for basic necessities like food, clothing, housing, etc. 805 million of people in the world don't have sufficient food. They constantly have to look for food. More than 750 people, 750 million people, 750 million, not just 750 people, 750 million people have no access to clean water and the diarrhea caused by unclean water and dirty hands kills approximately 842,000 people a year around the globe. One quarter of the entire world's population, which is about 1.6 billion people, don't have access to electricity. And 80%, 80% of the entire world's population have less than $10 a day for just basic necessities like food, clothing, housing, etc. This means, I want to bring it to us, this means that if you have access to electricity, if you have access to clean water and food, then you live in relative prosperity. But if you have more than $300 a month, and I'm not saying $300 a day, $300 a month for basic necessities like food, clothing, and housing, then you are in the 20% of world's population that lives significantly better, significantly better than the rest of 80% of the world's population. But despite all of it, there are so many people in our country who are not happy with what they have. Have you seen those people? Oh, everywhere. Probably we are some of those as well. When we look at some other people, say, oh, I don't have this, I don't have that. I would like to have this or that, and we become unhappy. But the main reason why people are not happy, or I would say one of the main reasons why people are unhappy with their lives is because they don't know why they live here. People think that I need to get something. I need to earn something. I need to become someone. And whenever they reach that, if they reach it, they say, and what's that? What's after that? What am I going to do? And people are constantly striving for something. And whenever they get it, if they get it, they just find that there is no satisfaction in this. There is no purpose. There is no purpose in life. Unfortunately, even Christians, even Christians quite often live with no joy, live with the life that has no meaning. Even if you go and ask Christians, like, what's the meaning of life? And they will give you an answer. Usually they like, okay, that's the meaning of life. Like, that's the purpose of life. But whenever you start going deeper, they, they understand, like, I don't live like that. That's not the purpose of my life. I don't live because of that. So, I would like to find the answers to the question, what is the purpose of my life in the book of the preacher? Do you know that in the Bible we have the book of the preacher? We have the book of the preacher, and it's Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes, I hope you know that no, uh, under the name Ecclesiastes, no one but Solomon, Solomon, uh, Solomon himself. So Solomon, uh, the king, in his book, he wants to find the answer to the question. The main question that Solomon asks, does it worth living? That's the question he asks through the entire book. 
Does it worth living? At one point of his life, he decides to test himself. And he tests himself in a lot of things. If you read that book, you know that he was trying to test himself in pleasures, in laughter, in wine, in architecture and building, in gardening, and so on. He had the possibilities to test himself in a lot of different things. We don't have all of that, but luckily we have Solomon who was able to do that, so we can look where he got. Uh, the result of everything what he has done is written in uh, chapter 2, verse 10. Look with me, Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verse 10. He describes what happened. He says, And whatever my eyes desired, I did not keep from them. He says, I kept my heart from no pleasure, for my, hand, my heart found pleasure in all my toil, and this was my reward for all my toil. Then, says Solomon, then I considered all that my hands had done and the toil I had expended in doing it. And behold, that's his answer, behold, all was vanity and striving after wind, and there was nothing to be gained under the sun. If you want to repeat the way Solomon did, you can try. I'm not sure if you have the same opportunities and possibilities that Solomon had, but even if you have, most likely you'll come to the same conclusion. He looked back to his activities, and the only conclusion he has made is all was vanity, vapor, and striving after wind, and there is nothing to be gained under the sun. And if you had a chance to read this book, um, you probably noticed that this is quite a pessimistic book. If you look a little bit further in chapter 2, verse 17, chapter 2, verse 17, what Solomon says, he says, So I hated life because what is done under the sun was grievous to me, for all is vanity and striving after wind. In verse 18, he says, I hated. I hated all my toil in which I told under the sun, seeing that I must leave it to the men who will come after me. That's quite pessimistic. I hated my life. I hated everything what I was doing. Solomon writes his book around three main points. The main point number one and we're not going to discuss it here. I'm just going to show you the structure. The main point, number one, he declares the problem. And the problem I already told you, he says, it's not worth living. It's not worth living. That's what Solomon came up with. In chapters 1 and 2, he describes it. He says, life is monotonous, wisdom is vain, wealth is fleeting, and death is inevitable. What's the point of living? Life is not, life is not, not, not worth living. Then, in the uh, uh, second main point, he discusses this problem. And, and it happens in chapter 3 to 10, when he kind of goes to each point that he initially proposed. And he talks about monotony of life. He talks about the vanity of wisdom and so on. And after each of this point, he comes to the conclusion, enjoy your life now. Enjoy your life now, because life it does, it, it's not worth living. But then, in the third point, which is chapter, chapters 11 and 12, he gives the solution to the problem. And the solution that he comes up with, he says, live by faith, enjoy your life now, and be ready for judgment. That's his solution. But the main problem with Solomon's view that he begins his book looking at life from the human point of view. He begins this book saying, under the sun, under heaven. And every time he says this, under the sun, under heaven, it means that this is human point of view. He looks at the most desired things like wealth, like achievements, even wisdom. He looks at all of that and he says, 
That's all vanity. It's all emptiness. And it's all striving after wind. But at the very end, at the end of, at the very end of his book, he brings us to the conclusion. And I want you to read with me chapter 12, verse, verse 13. 12, 13. Look at what Solomon writes there. The end, the end of the matter. All has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments. For this is the whole duty of man. The entire book, Solomon proves that if you just look at this life from the human point of view, all you get is frustration. All you get is depression. There is no way. There is no way to find joy and satisfaction in absolutely anything. doesn't matter what you achieve in this life. You will never find joy and satisfaction if you will look at this life only from the human point of view. Though, he also says that you can have the life of enjoyment and satisfaction if you understand what the purpose of your life is. And I want to read with you chapter 2, verses 24 through 26. This is our main text for today. Ecclesiastes chapter 2, verses 24 and following. Solomon writes, There is nothing better for a person that he should eat and drink and find enjoyment in his toil. This also I saw is from the hand of God. For apart from him, who can eat or who can have enjoyment? For to the one who pleases him, God has given wisdom and knowledge and joy. But to the sinner, he has given the business of gathering and collecting only to give to one who pleases God. This also is vanity and a striving after wind. In this text, we can find the answer, the answer to the question of what's the purpose of my life? What's the purpose of my life? We can find that answer so that we could live this life with joy and with satisfaction. And this answer has three facets, um, you know, like, like a diamond. For example, you go to the jeweler's store, and the jeweler, he doesn't give you just the diamond, and you're like, oh, look at the diamond. What he does, he actually brings black cloth, velvet. He puts the diamond on the velvet, but then he shines it with the light. And whenever diamond is on a black velvet, and the light is shining, you can see the different facets of this diamond. You can see how it shines differently. So basically what Solomon does here, he kind of gives us this diamond, and he wants us to see those different facets of this diamond, how this light is shining. So the first facet of that diamond or that answer, uh, which is answering to the question, what's the purpose of my life? The first facet is you've got life to know your God. You've got life. To know your God. Where did I get that? Look again at verse 24. Someone kind of repeats it constantly. He says, um, uh, uh, look, he says several times, this is from the hand of God in verse 24. Then in verse 25, he says, for apart from him, from him who? From God, who can eat or who can have enjoyment? And then in verse 24, he says again, For to the one who pleases him, God has given wisdom and knowledge. God. Everywhere is God. And we already read Ecclesiastes 12, 13, where Solomon says, The end of the matter, all has been heard. And what has been heard? What's the end of the matter? Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. Fearing God. That's the synonymous to know God, to know who he is, and to have that holy fear of God. That's what 
Deuteronomy 6 says. Deuteronomy 6 was written before, significantly before Solomon. Uh, and Deuteronomy 6, verse 1 says, Now this is the commandment, the statutes and the rules that the Lord your God commanded me to teach you, that you may do them in the land to which you are going over to possess it. And what's the commandment? That you, the nation of Israel, that you may fear the Lord your God, you and your sons and your sons' sons by keeping all his statutes and his commandments. Friends, maybe that sounds so basic, but unless you know God, you will never, and I'm going to repeat it, you will never be able to find the real purpose of your life unless you know God. And that's what happens to every person on this planet. People think that, well, I need to get wealth. I need to get my possessions. Maybe I need to be recognized. Maybe I need to get my recognition. And they put it as their life's goal. I need to achieve that goal. I need to get there. I need to get my first million by 25 years old. Or whatever the goal you put. People put that, but as soon as they achieve that goal, what happens? There's nothing after that. People are like, okay, I got it. What am I going to do after that? Where am I going? They have to put another goal in front of them because otherwise there's no meaning after that. What am I going to do? And this is what Solomon calls vanity. Vanity is vapor. Basically, you're striving, you're achieving, you're trying to get it, but whenever you get it, what do you get? You're catching, you're catching, you caught the wind, you caught the air. That's what you've got. And you think that to get happiness, to get satisfaction, oh, you need just to get another project finished. You just need to make another million or, I don't know, maybe for someone to make another billion or whatever. But as soon as you get it, there's just emptiness. And Jesus himself said the same thing. Matthew 16. Matthew 16, verse 26. Jesus says, For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? Nothing. Nothing. It gains absolutely nothing if you gain the entire world. If you get all you want, but you forfeit your soul. In Psalm 45, Psalm 45 verse 18, we read uh, what um, a psalm, a psalm, a psalmist says. He says, the Lord is near to all who call on him. To all who call on him in truth. And, and then he says, he fulfills the desire of those who fear him. And that's the same word. Who fear him, who knows God. He also hears their cry and saves them. In John uh, chapter 10, verse 10, Jesus says, I came that they may have life. You will never be able to have fulfilled life. But he says, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. No life without God. You will never be able to find satisfaction without God. So, I want to tell you right now, that's what Solomon tells here, and that's the conclusion he comes at the end of his book. Fear God. Fear the Lord. Then you'll find purpose to your life. There is no way to find purpose to your life if you don't know God. There is no way. So that was the first facet of uh, this diamond of that answer. But there is a second facet as well to that um, answer, to the question of what's the purpose of my life. And the second one is you've got life to enjoy simple things. God gave you life to enjoy simple things. Where did I get that? Look at verse 24. Someone says, there is nothing better for a person than that he should eat and drink and find enjoyment in his toil. This is also I saw, I saw is from the hand of God, for apart from him 
who can eat or who can have enjoyment. Have you ever thought that to eat and to drink and find satisfaction in your labor and what you are doing is the highest good for a person? But that's what Solomon says. That's what the book of life says. Well, someone would say, but this is so trivial. We all have to eat if we want to survive. We all have to drink. And we all have to work. What's so good in this? Well, if you look at life without God, how Solomon initially looked at it, you will conclude that life is futile and meaningless. But if you look at life from the point of view of God, and that only God gives life and everything in life, and he gives it so that people would rejoice in it, everything changes. Everything changes. If we have what to eat and what to drink, if we can work and see the fruits of our labor, then we have all the best that man could have in this life. Just think about it. And Solomon highlights that again and again. Look again in chapter 3, a little bit further. Ecclesiastes 3, verse 12. 3, 12. Solomon says here, I perceived that there is nothing better for them than to be joyful and to do good as long as they live. Or in verse 22, the same chapter, chapter 3, 22, he says, So I saw that there is nothing better than a man should rejoice in his work, for that is his lot. If we understand what's most important in life, we can have joy regardless of circumstances. But what should be the cause of your joy? And Solomon describes it pretty simple. He says, we live, we have something to eat, we have something to drink, we can work, and there's nothing better for a man. Interestingly, Jesus himself said in Luke 12, 15, Luke 12, 15, Jesus says, beware and be on your guard against every form of greed. For not even when one has an abundance does his life consist of his possessions. Dear friends, your life does not consist of your possessions. Even if you have an abundance. As I said in the beginning, we all live in a really, really, really prosperous country. We have significantly more than most of the world around us. But even if you have all of that, your life does not consist of your possessions. No. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 6, Paul writes, But godliness actually is a means of great gain when accompanied by contentment. For we have brought nothing into the world, so we cannot take anything out of out of it either. If we have food, says Paul, look, if we have food and we have covering, with these we shall be content. Paul seconds the same thing. We shall be content. Dear friends, you don't need a mansion to enjoy your life. You don't need a $100,000 car to enjoy life, or maybe for someone it's not a hundred thousand, maybe it's a two million dollar car. Like recently, I was watching that uh, two million dollar McLaren P1 floating down the street in Florida after that hurricane, and the person just bought it like several days ago, brand new car. So, you don't need it to enjoy your life, guys. You don't need it. You don't need an expensive clothes to enjoy your life. All you need is to be able to eat and drink. And to see the results of your labor. And there is nothing. Solomon says there is nothing better for a man than this. But you can't get this enjoyment without God. As we already said, you can't get this enjoyment if you don't know God. Because everyone receives his food and drinks and ability to work. But we receive it from 
God. You can't have it without God. You can't have it if God will not give it to you. There's one really great example that I want to read for you. It's uh, from the book of Ruth. We will not have those texts in um, PowerPoint, but I want to read from the book of Ruth, chapter 1. It's a, it's a really great example. Ch- uh, Ruth, uh, Ruth, chapter 1, uh, verse 1. R- please read with me. Um, Ruth, it's a small book. Uh, it actually comes right before 1 Samuel. There we, uh, 1 Samuel, and uh, if you can find that. Uh, the book of Ruth, uh, we read, 1-1. Uh, in the days when the judges ruled there was a famine in the land, and the men of Bethlehem and Judah went to sojourn in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi, and the names of his two sons were Mahlon and Kilion. They were Ephrathites from Bethlehem in Judah, they went to the country of Moab and remained there. But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two sons. These two Moabite wives, the name of the one was uh, Orpah and the name of the other Ruth, they lived there about ten years, and both Mahlon and Kilion died, so that the woman was left with, without her two sons and her husband. That's kind of an interesting story. If you have never heard, uh, the city, uh, I mean, the town they went uh, uh, was Bethlehem. Bethlehem literally means the house of bread. So it happened that in that town, in Bethlehem, there was a famine. So they decided to leave the house of bread, Bethlehem, and go to Moab to live there. And they go there, but what happens? Maybe they got food, but having food doesn't mean that you will live. And you can see, that's a great example that everything what we have, the ability to eat and drink and to work, is coming from God. And that's what Solomon says. You don't get it because you are so good. You get it from God. You receive it from God. Like, like Mahlon, Kilion, and uh, their father, they went to Moab. They thought they're going to live there. They're going to prosper. And like one preacher said, you can have a full stomach, but you'll not, you'll not be able to enjoy it because God will take your life. So, do you understand what's important in your life? Do you understand that every day when you eat and drink and then go to work and see the results of your work, you experience the highest good you can ever experience on this earth? And then I want to ask you, are you content with what you have in your life. Or maybe you're waiting for a better job to enjoy this life. Maybe you're better for a better, uh, maybe you're waiting for a better circumstances to enjoy your life. Maybe you're waiting for a better people around you to enjoy your life. Or maybe you're waiting for something better, better. You don't even know what you're waiting for. You're just waiting for something better to enjoy your life. But someone says, if you have it, you've got the best you can get. There's nothing better than that. You can enjoy your life. You can be content. You can be content in the really simple things. So, answering the question, what is the purpose of life? We already said that you've got life to know God, and without it, you will never be able to know the purpose of life. And you've got life to enjoy simple things in this life. And we have one last facet um, of this answer. The last facet says, you've got life to please God. You've got life to please God. Look at the beginning of verse 26 again. Um, In verse 26, Alma writes, "For For to the one who pleases him, God has given wisdom and knowledge and joy. The person who eats and drinks and finds enjoyment in his toil and understands that this is all coming from the hand of God gets on the path. He gets on the path of obedience to God. And obedience is always, I want to say it again, obedience is always pleasing to God. And I want want you to notice that this person is not good or pleasant in his own eyes. This is how God 
say, sees this person. This is how God sees him. And this is very important because often we tend to think so much better of ourselves. And we can sell, say about ourselves, well, I'm, I'm not that bad. I'm actually pretty good. I live a normal life. I don't have any really bad sins. But the question is not what you think about your life, but what God thinks about your life. Does God consider you the one who pleased him? Or that's only your decision? And maybe the question you have right now, but how do I know what God thinks about my life? Where do I get that knowledge? And friends, we have the Word of God. We have the Word of God where God shows His standard. And He shows whom God calls good and desirable, or who God calls pleasing in His sight. And again, I want to repeat that thing again, that if someone doesn't know God, if he doesn't have faith, he is not able to please God because Hebrews 11.6 says, Hebrews 11.6 says, and without faith, and here it says without saving faith, without faith it's impossible to please him for he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who seek him. But if I believe in God, and trusted my life to Jesus Christ. Can I say that I am pleasing in his eyes? Am I pleasing in his eyes? The Bible says, yes, I am. But here I want to read one text with you guys. It's going to be Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. If you open with me, please, Colossians 3. We're going to read a few verses uh, from that text. If you open your Bible, Colossians chapter 3, we're going to read verses 3 to 5. Paul writes, For you have died, and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. And then he, uh, he kind of starts uh, saying sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. Then in verse 8, he continues, says, you must put them all away. What? Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and absence talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. And if you look a little bit lower in verse 12, he continues, he says, Put on then as God's chosen one, holy and beloved, compassionate heart, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience, bearing with one another, and if one has a complaint against another, forgiving each other, as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. You know what? We know God. If you know God, you know God. You know what he says. But quite often, we may not go in that process that the Bible says, sanctification process. We are not sanctifying. We are not putting off our old self, self and putting on the new self that Paul writes in Colossians. He says, okay, you died. You died with Christ. You are dead to those sins. And now you have to Show it in reality that you are putting off your old self and putting on the new self. Unfortunately, quite often what happens, we start to create idols in our hearts. And our hearts were made to love and worship God. But since the fall, human beings have turned away from God and replaced him with multitude, with a multitude of substitutes. And uh, I'm reading the book right now, um, and the book is about uh, the heart, and it says the uh, heart is the uh, goal. And interestingly enough, it says here, when people reject God, they do not worship nothing. They worship anything. They worship anything. It's not like when you reject God, you worship 
nothing. You worship anything. And interestingly enough, it happens to all non-believers. Whenever they say, like, God is not there or they don't want to worship God, they will worship anyways. They will worship, but they will worship absolutely anything in this world. But unfortunately, that happens to the believers as well. When they look and they say, well, I've, I have something with so taking so much space in my heart. So we have become people who put substitutes in our heart for God. And we need to understand that idols always demand sacrifices. Idols take time. They take money. They take focus. They take te- attention. And as we serve our idol, we cheat God. If money has become our idol, we accumulate wealth and spend lots of time and energy thinking about how to gain or spend money instead of how to invest in the work of the gospel. If entertainment is our God, we spend far too much time watching movies, listening to music and surfing the internet, and far too little time with God. If our image is our God, we spend far too much time and attention on how other people perceive us and what they think of us and far too little time focused on what God thinks of us. But idols not just demand sacrifice. Idols of our hearts also tend to grow over time. And the author writes, interesting. Uh, he says, our appetite for pleasing an idol increases. That's why it is so dangerous to give an idol a foothold in your life. Give an idol an inch and it will take a mile. The man who begins with a little pornography is soon gripped by it and wants more and more. The woman who finds some solace and comfort in eating finds that it becomes harder and harder not to eat just as God should become greater and greater in our lives so God's substitutes also increase. And another crucial dynamic to note is that idols always fail us. They promise much but deliver little. Strangely, that is why we go back for more. They don't satisfy. Food doesn't satisfy the deep longing of our hearts. Neither does golf, sex, money, or success. The heart has been made for God, not for lame substitutes. So no matter how much of your idol we get, we never get enough to feel it's really good. The thrill is fleeting. The sense of satisfaction is only momentary. More often than not, the aftertaste is appalling, uh, and we are left feeling empty and cheated. But the sinful heart is foolish enough to go back for more. We think that next time it will be more satisfying, and unfortunately that happens not just to non-believers. Non-believers, that's, that's their life. That's how they live. That's what they live for, but unfortunately it happens to the believers as well. And that's when we start losing joy, because... As we read in Colossians, because as we read for the one who pleases him, pleases God, God wants us to learn how to live life pleasing to him. But quite often, we substitute that with those idols we spend time for, money, and everything. So, first, we have to be saved. Secondly, we have to have evidence of our salvation. Interesting enough, look at the last part of verse 26. Last part of verse 26 says, But to the sinner he has given the business of gathering and collecting, only to give to one who pleases God. This also is vanity and a striving after wind. It's a vivid contrast, guys. It's a vivid contrast of the one who is good or pleasing God and the one who God calls sinner. Look at life of this person. Look at the life of this person. Look at what he uh, he's doing. It says, 
God gives him the business. God gives him the business. You can say God gives him a work of gathering and collecting. And I want to say it's not just an accidental task. A sinner was given this task as God's judgment. And what the sinner is gathering, what is he collecting? And he collects and gathers absolutely everything. Wealth, projects, ideas, friends, fame, and you can go so on and on. He collects all of this, but it doesn't bring him joy. And as we already read, Solomon described it really well in his first chapters. And he continues, he says, there is no point in gathering all of that. He says, I tried all of that. It doesn't bring you joy. It doesn't bring you satisfaction. And he says, this also is vanity and striving after wind. It's quite interesting how person's values change throughout the life. If you look at the younger person and what they want to achieve, usually a younger person wants to achieve money, recognition, maybe acceptance. Then you can see a person in his 40s and 50s, and his values uh, usually are different. He wants power, he wants esteem, he wants influence. But then you look at those who are in their old age, and they have different values again. They want comfort, they want health, they want quiet life. And what it tells me, what it tells me that what you strive for in your 20s can be absolutely irrelevant in your 80s. But why is that? It can happen only if all you strive for was vanity and striving after wind. You are achieving that, but then you understand there is no satisfaction in that. I want to ask you a question. What's your life purpose? Why do you live here? Do you find enjoyment in knowing God, in appreciating simple things, just simple things that we have in life, and in pleasing Him? Or you are looking for that fulfillment somewhere else? For all the young people, I want to say, commit early and commit hard. Commit to the life that has meaning and brings glory to God. Commit early. Commit right now. And commit hard. For those who don't know God yet, I want to ask you, what are you waiting for? Why don't you trust your life to Jesus Christ so that you'd live a meaningful life instead of striving after win? Because as Jesus says in John 10, 10, he says, I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. There's no way to have it without him. And we'll remember the sufferings of Christ today. We'll remember that he suffered on our behalf. And this is a great reminder how to live a life that was filled with purpose. The entire life of Jesus Christ was filled with purpose. He lived to glorify his Father always. He committed hard from the very beginning, from when he was a child. He committed, I am committed to my father. I want to live my entire life for him. Let's look at him. Let's look at Jesus and learn from him. Jesus says in Matthew 11, Matthew 11, 29, he says, take my yoke, take my yoke upon you. Learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Dear friends, find the rest for your soul by learning from the Prince of Peace, from Jesus himself. Learn from him. May God help us to do that in our lives. Amen. Let us stand and pray and ask for Jesus' help in our lives. Heavenly Father, we thank you. Thank you for your word. Your word that cuts straight and shows us where we are and what you expect from us. Heavenly Father, we thank you that 
today we see that our greatest need is to know you, first of all. We want to appreciate all the little things that you give us in life. And we want to grow. We want to grow in the grace. We want to grow in our sanctification, in our, um, in our ability to show Jesus Christ in our lives more. And Father, I ask you for everyone who's here right now. I ask you for those who don't know you yet. Father, please stir their hearts. Let them understand that they will never be able to have life of joy, satisfaction, satisfaction without you, Lord. Help them to understand that they need you to be able to know what's the purpose of life. And I also pray for everyone who already know you. Father, please help us to learn from Jesus Christ how to live life that's obedient to you and obedient to your word. We ask all of that in the greatest name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen.